good morning good morning welcome to day 10 day 10 day 10 today is a good day y'all it is a good day it's november 1st the the first of the uh month of thanksgiving i don't know about y'all but i love thanksgiving i love to cook i love to spend time with family i love that the whole world just takes a month even if it's just a month i love that the whole world can come together and find things to be grateful for in this month so with that being said the lord had me up early this morning and you know you come to love those moments um, with the lord when everything's quiet i have four kids at home so it, it's rare when i have a quiet moment so when when the lord gets me up even though i'm just like lord i'm tired it's early um when it's all said and done i'm just truly grateful because you don't get times like that and so i'm grateful that the lord um saw 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 it right to give me the privilege and honor to wake me up early in the morning to have that time with him to deposit something into my spirit so this morning the lord brought me to um john 4 and it, it's definitely a passage that a lot of people especially if you've grown up in church know um but i'm also aware that not everyone grew up in church not everyone's a bible scholar you know i, I say it a lot that you know i grew up in church and i still don't know the bible as much as other people that i know so um the story about the samaritan woman was <clears throat> at that point jesus was trying to go um from judea to galilee and the shortest distance it would have taken forever to go around but the shortest distance was to go through um samaritan and uh samaria but the thing about samaria was that um the jews and the samaritans just hated each other the jews really hated um the samaritans they kind of looked at them as like the knockoff jews and so um, they really didn't have any dealings with them. So the fact that Jesus chose to go through Samaria, through a town, through, through an area that um, the Jews were known to hate, um, spoke volumes. I mean, looking at it now as a person reading the word, when someone intentionally decides to go through a city full of people that hate them and they, um, and their people hate their people, um, you have to know he's up to something <laughs> and so he he goes to this well and there's a samaritan woman there and he begins to speak to her he's like you know hey can you get me some water and she's looking at him like number one you're a jew and i'm a samaritan woman why are you even talking to me like we already know what the deal is you already know your people don't like my people my people don't like your people so why are you talking to me number two you don't even have a bucket so where what you plan on having me use to get you this water because this well is deep and you don't have nothing to get this water and so during that time he he then asked her you know like well where's your husband and you know she looked at him and she was like um i'm not married and he said well according to what i know you have five husbands and you're right you're not married because the guy you're living with is not your husband and so she looked at him and she was like okay so i'm guessing you're a prophet and it almost kind of sparks her curiosity and he continues and he says you know you're, you're here to get water from a well and after you drink that water you're eventually going to have to come back and get some more water because you're going to be thirsty but the water that i offer you is the living water where you're thirst no more and so then she begins to um to speak of the Messiah that she was taught about and how he will come to tell us things about ourselves. You know, he'll come and tell us everything. And so he looks at her and he says, I am that Messiah. And so as he's saying that, you know, the disciples come back, you know, right on time for the whole conversation to finish. And she leaves and she goes back. She doesn't even get her water because she don't already got what she needed. And so she, she goes back into town and she tells them, you know, I've met the Messiah. He told me everything about myself, in which he didn't necessarily tell her everything about herself, but he told her enough for her to believe who he was. And so it was enough to spark their interest to come back, see for themselves, and believe for themselves. And so with that being said, there was a couple of things that the Lord um, showed me about this passage. A lot of people can take it and they can dissect it um, in different ways. But I believe what the Lord showed me today is very important for the time that we're living in. The one thing he showed was that the first thing she pointed out is, why are you talking to me? You're a Jew. 
you're a Jew, I'm a Samaritan. And that's a big thing in the time that we're living in. You know, um, it's not just about race, you know, um, black, white, Hispanic, Asian, Indian, Middle Eastern, whatever. But um, it's not also about, it's not just also about Christians and non-Christians, but it's also about Christians in general. You know, we as Christians, there, there's so many different beliefs in the Christian world. You know, you, you're either going to a Baptist church, you're going to a Pentecostal church, you're non-denominational, you're a Seventh-day Adventist, you're Mormon. You There's all these different, you know, evangelical Christians. There's just all these different belief systems within the Christian family that at times, you know, for someone who's Baptist or for someone who's Pentecostal to approach someone who's Baptist and be like, I have a word from the Lord for you. You're looking at them like, you need to get out of my face because I don't even do your kind, you know? And so it was a huge thing for Jesus to sit there as a Jew and to open his mouth and speak to someone who was a Samaritan. But it was also a big thing for that Samaritan woman to even turn to him and say anything to him. So they both had to look past their differences and have a conversation. Not only do they have to look past their differences, but you know, one thing that God has shown me, and I believe he's showing everyone, is that he will use the most unlikely person to speak a word into your heart. And unless we're open to receiving that word from someone who may, necessar may not necessarily look like God or look like us or what we perceive a Christian to be, we're gonna miss out on some big things. He'll also let his spirit be known. When he spoke um, about her husbands, you know, and he spoke to her about her situation and what she was living in, that sin that she was living in at the time, he was literally showing her, you know, he was telling her about her sin, but he was doing it in love. And I think that's another big thing is that when we come from different Christian backgrounds or when we come from a non-Christian background or when we come from a Christian background, speaking to someone, who has never gone to church, a lot of times people tend to have that superiority complex. You know, it's like, you know, well, I was raised in church and you weren't, so you know I'm better than you. So let me tell you about you because obviously you don't know. Or, you know, well, I'm Pentecostal and you're Seventh-day Adventist, so obviously you, you don't missed out on something. And I, I don't tapped into that higher level of, of um, the spirit that makes me better than you. So let me tell you about yourself. And it's all about how you approach things. You know, number one, we're all God's children. God is the head and we are the body. We're all in the same body. Nobody else is in another body. Nobody else is in some higher. No, we're all, we all make up one body in Christ. So it's how you perceive things. It's your perception on, of, of other people. When you look at other people, are you looking at them as being lower than you? Or when you look at other people, are you looking at them as your brother and sister in Christ? Are you loving them for who they are in that moment? Because you can see who God has made them to be. Or are you giving them that pity love? Like, you know what I mean? I love you because I have to love you. But quite honestly, I don't want to chill with you. You're not in my circle. You're not good enough for me. How are you looking at these people? It says, um, notice he didn't judge her. He didn't look sideways at her or mock her. He didn't damn her to hell. He simply spoke truth in a loving way. He wanted her to see who he was in a way that wouldn't have her rolling her eyes and walking away. He understood that approach is everything. Approach is everything. At that point, they began to speak on worship, and she acknowledged that she knew that the Messiah was coming. He revealed himself as the Messiah, just as the disciples came. You know, as I was reading it, I was like, how funny, because in the word, it says, um, at that point, it says um, in John 4, 27, at that point, his disciples came, and they marveled that he talked with a woman, yet no one said, what do you seek or why are they why are you talking to her you know his timing was everything when um, my spiritual mother um miss mary mama mama scott as i call her the one thing she says is god has impeccable timing and he really did you know he knew that at that point at the well he needed to speak to her before those disciples came because had those disciples been there 
they would have blocked him. They would have tried. They would have. They would have reminded him like, um, she's a Samaritan. You're a Jew. Yeah, like we're not even supposed to be talking. And she would have missed out on that living water that he was trying to give her. So timing is everything. We always have to have discernment, not only in the way we view people, not only in the way we speak to people, but in the timing that we speak to people. In the timing that we speak to people. Had those disciples come a minute early, had he waited a little longer to speak to her, they would have came in and blocked something that could have happened. They would have came in and blocked that movement. At that point, she leaves, she goes, tells everyone. Now, it was his decision to speak to her to begin with as a Jew, speaking to a Samaritan that caught her attention. It was his loving approach that caught her attention long enough to minister to her. And the spirit within him that proved himself to her, which not just ministered to her and made her believe, but pushed her to tell others who then came to see for themselves and were saved. It's all, it, it, there's an order to things. How you perceive a person is what's going to open that door or completely build that wall between that opportunity for ministry and losing a soul. When you see someone on the street, you know, I have people that will see me. They'll see, you know, a tattoo or two. They'll see my nose ring and they'll immediately dismiss me because, you know, I don't look like Jesus to them. I don't even get to open my mouth. And they're just like, oh, she doesn't have nothing to say to me. I, 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 I wear my turtlenecks and, and you know, I, I have my long hair and I hold my Bible here and I have my necklace, you know, with my big old cross and she doesn't look like me, so she's not worth my time. But you have no clue what a person, what the substance that's within a person, you know, same for me. I can go somewhere and see someone with a tank top, tattooed up, piercings everywhere, you know, a mohawk, you know, bright purple hair or whatever, and unless I can see them with the eyes of Christ, unless I choose to see them with the eyes of Christ, I will completely dismiss them and dismiss the word that they can have for me. Completely dismiss it. It's about how you speak to people. Not only being perceptive, but how are you speaking to people? Are you speaking to them in love? Or are you throwing scriptures at them and telling them that they're going to go to hell if they don't change? You, ain't even take, you haven't even taken the time to have a conversation with them. But just by their pictures alone on, on their social media, you just assume that they're damned to hell. And they're headed straight to hell. So let me throw all these scriptures on their wall because that's how I'm going to save them. No, that's how you're going to make them stay home and not waste their time going to church. That's how you're gonna make them not waste their time talking to anyone else that's Christian. That's how you're gonna make them shun anything and everything of God because of people like you who think that, you know, throwing scripture at people and fighting with them on social media is going to save them. It's not going to save them. It's not gonna save them at all. The one thing that God did, when, when Jesus did that, he started a movement. And that word movement has been in my spirit for a while. So I looked it up. Movement. A group of people working together to advance their shared political, social, and artistic ideas. Matthew 18, 20 says, For where there are two or three gathered in my name, there I am with them. A group. All you need is two. All you need is two or three people that will walk in agreement. Not look like each other. Not not sit there and, and wear the same outfits, but two or three people that can come to agreement within their hearts who God is and what God has sent them there to do and the assignment God has for their lives. And you can create a movement. Movement also is an act of changing um, physical location or position or having of change. I also like it says the act or process of moving people or things from one position to another. Come on, 1 Peter 2 9. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of Him who called you out of darkness into His wonderful light. We were meant to be different, we weren't meant to fit in. We all have our own gifts and our own ways that God 
uses us to speak to the world. Don't allow differences in appearance, race, lifestyle, economic status, or location to keep you from opening your mouth or receiving anything that God has for you. Your very breakthrough can come from an unorthodox source and because you're not open to it, because it doesn't look like what you're expecting, you'll miss out. It's time to drop our blinders. It's time to drop everything we thought things were going to look like. It's time to drop everything we thought God was going to look like. Everything we thought people were going to look, dress, and smell like when it comes to the kingdom of God. And be open to knowing that God will use anyone to advance his kingdom. They don't have to wear a suit. They don't have to have neat hair. They don't have to have long hair. They don't have to have anything specific on their head. They, they don't even have to speak a certain way. They don't have to sit there and know, memorize the Bible back and forth and throw all the scriptures at you. They can use their life. They don't have to say God every two seconds. They can live it out in the way they, they live their lives. We have to get to a point where we drop the blinders and we, we start being open to however God's going to use someone in whatever way. And when we do that, when we do that and we come into agreement with the Holy Spirit and come into alignment with his word and his assignment for our lives, a movement will start. A movement will start. God is trying to start a movement in this land. He's trying to start a movement and it starts with us as believers. It starts with us as believers putting down our prejudices, taking down our blinders, taking down our, our preconceived thoughts of what it was going to be and being open to what it's going to be. So God, today we thank you. We thank you for what you're speaking into our lives. We thank you for everything that you're doing in our lives. And Lord, we ask you to forgive us, God. Forgive us for, for having these these um, expectations of what we thought things were going to look like, of, of who we thought were going to speak into our lives, of who we thought you were going to use, God. Forgive us for, for being prejudice of people who, who we feel don't look like you, who we feel don't live lives that are pleasing in your sight, God. God, forgive us for not loving people for who they are and where they are in you right now because it's not who they're going to be. It's not who you've made them to be. We know that you made us all, that you, you have something greater for all of us, God. Forgive us for judging people for where they're at now, for their, their circumstances right now, God, and for not looking at them through your eyes, Lord. Lord, we ask you, God, to just, just give us a heart, a real heart for people, God. Give us a real heart for people. Give us a heart. Give us eyes to see people as you see them. Give us a heart and the words to speak in love to everyone and anyone that you would have us to speak to, Lord. God, we just pray that you would have your way in our lives, that you would open our eyes to see things as you would want us to see things. Open our ears to hear things, Lord. Open our hearts to be receptive to anything and everything you would have for us, no matter how you send it or who you send it through, God. God, we thank you because we want to start a movement, God. We're, we're tired of, of being just people that are known to judge, God. We want to start a movement, a love movement, God. Help us to start that love movement, God. There are people who are needing you. There are people who are crying out for you. People are dying every day without you, God. And we, we need to step it up, Lord. Help us to step it up. So God, we thank you. We thank you for what you're continuing to do in our lives. We thank you for what you're continuing to do in this challenge and through this challenge, God. And we'll give you all the glory, God. All the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. You guys be blessed. Let's start that movement.